Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the DBI uh, residential remodel portion of the fair. Uh, you're all very welcome, and I'd like to say a couple of things. Uh, it's really important that we put this information out there, which facilitates a good understanding, especially in regard to property owners and what the requirements are and how we can accommodate your needs and give you a better understanding of the process. That's really what it's all about. So, the team is here. Uh, I was going to do the introductions, but I got beaten to the punch already. So, uh, uh, we have Joe Hospital here. If you were sitting in the previous presentation, you heard his comments. Uh, alongside him is Ken Burke, who is from our electrical inspection division. And Steve Pinelli is uh, all the ways on the left over here. He's our chief plumbing inspector. So, just in brief overview, we're going to be uh, putting information out there from four divisions within the department. Building inspection, that's me. We have a representative from Plan Check here. This is before the permit is issued. This is the review stage. We have electrical and plumbing. So building electrical and plumbing is all after issuance. So you guys already have your permit at that point and you're engaging with the inspector. Now, how many of you guys are homeowners here? Okay, so really, we know the construction industry folks. To me, you are uh, our target market here because we want to help with uh, education and making sure that you know what it is that needs to be done in order to secure a permit. Now, the residential remodel is it's broken into like three, two, three different things, let's say. You have a permit application that you file in regard to getting the simple permit. Getting the simple permit is just an application. What we're trying to do here is we're trying to maintain minimum standards for habitability and life safety. So these are the homes you live in, so we want to make sure that whatever work is being done meets at least the minimum standards for safety. So energy conservation is another one. If you're living in your home, you're all probably paying a PG&E bill. You'd like to know that as a result of your remodel that there's the right insulation in the walls, that you're using the proper lighting, uh, and that you have the proper pipe insulation for your, your plumbing. That will help keep your PG&E bills down. Your utility bills in general will be, will be far less if you ensure that you have that, that insulation and energy conservation. And really what the trump card for me is that do you, do you meet the minimum code standards? So again, your building is safe. Our inspectors go out there. They know based on the building code, the plumbing code, the electrical code, what it is that you should have to maintain this hab habitability and life safety for your building. Again, th those are the benefits of having a permit, securing a permit. We have resources that you can go to. I really think that the, the website is invaluable because there's a lot of information there that will give you the background on, on a, a, a lot of ways of working through the system, which can be a complicated system. It can be daunting. You come down there, you walk in the door as a homeowner. It's, you look around and it's like, where do I go now? So just remember, there's a lot of resources there that browse the website before you come down. That's what I would do. Go on that website and just go through it. Try to find what it is your, your target is when you're coming down there. And there's a lot of very helpful people you know, around the building from when you come in the door, from the, initially from the information counter. If you need to go to planning, they're right there. You can talk to somebody from planning. Uh, so it really depends on, you know, what kind of permit you're getting, like I previously said. The over-the-counter permit, just an application, you're talking about a kitchen remodel, a bathroom remodel. Uh, you just fill out the application 
and usually you're out the door definitely the same day and usually it's 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 a lot shorter than that it's it's a matter of an hour or so if it's a simple kitchen bathroom remodel type permit uh, when you have a permit that requires plans it can still be over the counter but you're submitting plans along with that same application and that would be a case of where you're uh, let's say you're remodeling your kitchen, but you want, to op you want to open up the area between the dining room and the kitchen, so you want to remove that wall. So that's what the plans are needed for, to document the removal of the wall. So we're, essentially we're showing a new floor plan for the house. That's why we need plans. Then we get into the, the third scenario, which is the, where you need to submit plans, fill out an application, and material is taken in. That is not over the counter. That is for instances where you're adding to the envelope of the house, whether it be horizontal or vertical, or sometimes that may also include merging units or adding a, an accessory dwelling unit potentially, or you know things of that nature. So um, I'm going to turn it over now to Joe Hospital. So Joe, do you want to? Okay. Here? All right, thank you, Mr. O'Riordan. Um, I think uh, I think I kind of went over some of this, and for those of you who are here, it's going to be redundant information. But for those of you who just joined us, it'll be something fresh and new. Uh, my name is Joseph Ospital. I will. I am a certified ICC certified building inspector, plans examiner, and ICC ICC certified accessibility inspector. Uh, and I work for the San Francisco Department of Building Inspection. Um, so we'll go with possible over-the-counter permits without plans. Again, Pat touched on it. You have your window replacement in kind, um, you know, uh, skylight replacement in kind, decks and stairs, uh, repair or repl repair, less than 50% in kind, a cosmetic kitchen and bathroom mo room remodel where you're not changing the layout and you're not doing anything structural. Um, and by changing the layout, what I mean is you're not moving, removing, adding, or infilling any walls. Uh, dry rot and termite repair in kind, and re-roofing. Uh, possible over-the-counter permits without plans um, could possibly require a multi-agency review. Um, you know, depending on some roofing permits, if uh, it's a sloped roof visible from the street, they would need to get planning approval for the type of roofing material that they're going to put on the building. Um, other agencies may be required, uh, electrical, plumbing, mechanical. Um, if scaffolding is required in the public way, Department of Public Works, um, street permit, um, and, and, and those types of things. Again, I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to get too redundant. Type of over-the-counter permits with plans. We've got our kitchen and bathroom remodel, structural and non-structural. And what I mean by non-structural is you're, you're, making, you're, you're cutting a doorway into a non-bearing wall. Well, you're changing the layout of the kitchen or bathroom. You're enlarging a shower. You're you know, eliminating a wall and putting an island. All of that changes the layout and as such has to be documented in our records. Um, decks and stairs, if you're going to be doing more than 50% repair, you can still do it in kind, but you need drawings that show the in kind repair. Um, rooms downstairs adjacent to garage or conversion of non habitable space into the garage or, um, or conversion of non habitable space downstairs adjacent to the garage. You could do that with plans that could be an over the counter item. Um, when you're doing work that's not adding an additional dwelling unit or legalizing a unit. If you're just putting in a family room and a half bath or something, is something that could probably be done um, over the counter with plans. Foundation repairs and upgrades, if the structural can do the review in less than an hour and you're just not uh, changing the envelope of the building, again, that can be done over the counter with plans. Retaining walls under 10 feet, anything above 10 feet requires major engineering and probably and would not be you wouldn't be able to review it in less than an hour only because of the number of calculations that the uh, it would be required for the engineer to check and then voluntary or fences over six feet and I know some of you out there are thinking well, why do I need 
plans and you know everything all of this information for fences over six feet when fences under six feet you know I don't need plants or I don't even need a permit for and it's because when you get to a, when you get to a height of over six feet we're not worried about the fence you know it doesn't matter how heavy the fence is what you've created is a large sail and you've got a wind load and that and that large sail believe it or not could actually move and even you know uproot and end up in your neighbor's swimming pool or you know vegetable garden and you don't want that um, and then your voluntary seismic upgrades could be done over the counter with plan if it's approved to be done by you know um, a, a supervisor and it's deemed to be less than an hour uh, plans requiring intake again I know I went over this before so bear with me um, any new buildings any horizontal or vertical additions you're changing the uh, the envelope of the building solar installations uh, 4,000 kilowatts or above um, all of the, all of the above that I just mentioned require planning review in addition to architectural structural and mechanical okay and generally or, or projects over a hundred thousand dollars will need uh, bureau and streets and mapping review um, and then forms to be used for the building permit construction process the building application form we looked at it on the previous slide or the previous show or um, informational presentation thank you Pat <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna go ahead to the next page now <laughs> and again it's very similar to what was on the previous presentation um, you'll need your um, for the building and construction process, you've got your building permit application form, and again, it's either going to be a Type 3 or, or a Form 3 or a Form 8. Uh, form 8 being um, over-the-counter, Form 3, excuse me, yeah, Form 8 being over-the-counter, Form 3 being um, a submitted job. Um, the inspection records form, certificate of final uh, completion and occupancy is going to be touched on by our next presenter. And uh, then this is, what, this is what that pink form looks like. And it's actually not a lot of information that you would have to fill out. I mean, it would be um, your address, um, your name, maybe your contractor's name, um, and the scope of work, what you're planning on doing from there. The rest of it, you'll have help filling out at the information desk, being the construction type, the occupancy, uh, block and lot, things like that. Um, so I think I've gone over everything that I need to go over, and I've actually done it twice so far today. So I'd like to turn it over um, to our next presenter, Mr. Burke. Thank you, Joe. My name is Ken Burke, uh, Acting Chief Electrical Inspector for the Department of Building Inspections. I'm going to be uh, going over the... Do you have the button there? Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Oops. Let me go back. The inspection process, okay? There's a diagram up on the board there. Um, after your permit is issued, you begin the, the work process, and when you are ready, you can schedule an inspection, okay? Um, the inspectors, uh, inspections can be made uh, through the automated inspection scheduling system. Uh, the phone number is up there. Also, you can, um, you can schedule online. Um, through the DBI website, if you're if you're set up that way, uh, most homeowners aren't going to be that way, but uh, contractors, it's not uncommon. Uh, once the inspection, uh, the work's begun, you schedule your inspection. You, 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 the inspector comes out to the property and and goes over the, uh, what what you've done out there. Uh, you're depending on the scope of your work. You get a rough inspection, then you uh, you, you go through. Uh, your framing, your electrical, your plumbing, you get cover up for all that. Uh, the project moves on and you can, uh, once you uh, put in all your finishes, you call for a final inspection and uh, same thing, you just go ahead and schedule that. And then the, uh, the department prides ourselves in, in um, responding to your requests within 48 hours. So, um, you know, give it a day or two and you, you'll, your inspection should be uh, uh, no problem getting an inspection. Um, after your final, 
you get your job card signed off, and you can get your uh, cert certificate of final completion, and then you can also, after that, you visit the website to ensure that every all the paperwork's been completed. Okay. Some general information for scheduling your inspections, the phone number to talk to the clerks to get on the schedule. Call for uh, 48 hours uh, in advance to uh, make sure everything moves along smoothly for you. You can call between 8.30 and 3 o'clock to book your inspection through the clerks. Again, you can schedule online uh, at any time. Uh, and then, let's see here. The contractors can schedule online. Uh, and if you, the morning of your inspection, you can call, um, call the inspector, or a lot of times the inspector will call you, the contact on the inspection uh, information to narrow down a window for you. We'll try to give you, we'll give you a one hour window so you're not waiting all day for your inspection. Uh, inspectors are in the field from 8.30 to 3 o'clock, and they return to the, they're in the office from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning when you can call them, or again, you can call them or visit the counter between 3 and 4 uh, if you have any paperwork or uh, uh, to take care of with the inspector or any questions uh, regarding your job specifically, you can get the district inspector at the counter between 3 and 4. Um, I will turn this over now to uh, Steve Pinelli. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Pinelli, Chief Plumbing Inspector. Uh, I've been with the department for 17 years and been doing plumbing for about 26 now. So I understand where we're going back and forth. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you. That's a job card. That's our main contract. That's going to be where you're going to have most of your sign-offs for everything that's happening. Uh, it's going to look, that's what you're going to get when you pay for your permit once you come through the door. And if you want to get it as a homeowner, that's going to be doing work. Be whatever it may be, that's what you're going to get first. If you're doing plumbing work, if you're doing electrical work, that's going to be a homeowner's permit. That's totally different. You're going to come to the third floor, you're going to speak with myself possibly, an inspector that's on duty for electrical and for plumbing, and go through the process of getting a homeowner permit. Just because you want a homeowner's permit sometimes doesn't mean you get one because you might not know everything code as has to be installed. So we're going to ask you a few questions and go through the process. But you would have a plumbing or electrical permit, and unfortunately I did not put those slides in there to show you. My bad, I'm sorry. This is the inside of that job card. Inside of that job card is going to have signatures on there that go through. Um, basically, if you look on that left-hand side, facing that on the left hand side in the middle there towards the top you're going to see my signature I put my signature on everything normally you won't see the same signature on everything you're going to have the underground work if you have underground work that's being done that'll be the first thing that gets signed off then right below that you're going to have rough inspections and when we say rough inspections we mean we're going to have your plumbing rough you're going to have your electrical rough and you're going to have building now, in order, what we'd like to see and what works best for us, and we're talking about basic kitchen and bathroom. I'm not going into major construction because most times if it gets into major constructions, not too many homeowners are going to do their own additional horizontal and, and vertical additions. It's going to be through a contractor. But I'm giving you stuff to, I want you to understand the process and what you need to look for. So what you're going to see on a basic kitchen or bath, you're going to see something like that where you're going to have the rough sign off. Now, on that rough sign off, it's going to say rough plumbing, shower pan, rough electrical. If you've got HVAC that's being done, your heating, you're going to have that flues that are going to be inspected. This is everything usually that's going to get covered up by sheetrock or tile whatever's, or fixtures. Whatever's going to be covered before it gets covered, we want to see this. Make sure it's tested and done correctly. So you're usually going to get your plumbing inspector out there, your electrical inspector out there first. Once their sign-offs are done, then you're going to have the building inspector will come out there and he'll be the final one. He's on the very bottom there saying it's okay to cover and everything's all right. On the right-hand side, that's the final side. That's going to be the completion. That's when we come out to your beautiful bathroom that you just did and we go out there and see the 
water closet, the toilet's in the correct place. We see the sink's done correctly, the shower's done right. Electrical is going to come out and look at all their outlets and everything. They're going to sign off. Once that's complete, you're going to call for building. They're going to come out, and they're going to sign it. Once they sign it, that's going to complete the process. They're going to give you a certificate of final completion, which looks like that. That certificate's going to be given, is going to be completed, and everything will be in the system. Now, when I say in the system, I mean our system at, at DBI, Department of Building Inspection, showing that we went out and we did the inspection, the permit's been completed. If you see a plumbing or electrical permits that are still in the issued stage and you have signatures right there, come down and see us. That means somebody didn't put something in and, and we, we might have missed something or it just didn't get into the system or didn't get saved. This is also something that everybody needs to keep. Any project that you have, anything that's done, this is the, one of the most important pieces of information you need to keep. This gives us the information that yes, we had somebody out there that inspected it, yes, we had somebody that signed off, and yes, it's done. Even if we have something that's still open, if we have something like that and it's completed, it's gonna give us a lot of help to actually close something out. I, we'll get to the questions after, oh, sorry, I just because I know I'll get a bunch of questions. Uh, on this slide here, and, and, and most of you have this slide, it shows final inspection, plumbing, electrical, mechanical, DPW sidewalks, streets, trees, special inspections. We're getting into something that's beyond what we would normally see with a homeowner, and I know most everybody in here is homeowners, and that's what they're asking about, so that's why I want to keep it too. When we're getting into sidewalks and streets and trees, that's when we're working outside the structure, building big projects, and going a little bit beyond what I would consider most homeowner permits that I've seen in the past 17 years. So I don't really want to kind of get into that. I kind of want to keep it basic. Uh, our goal is basically to value, we value your opinion. When you come down to the office, if you have an issue with an inspector, if you have a problem or something's happening or you don't understand something, come see us. We really appreciate you coming down and talking to us. Not yelling at us, coming down to talk to us and give us the information that, so we can help you. And that's what we're here for. Our goal is safety. Our main concern is our safety and to make sure that the citizens in San Francisco and yourselves doing everything to code and everything is safe. Everything else, if it's not safe, it's not to code, something happens, we don't want anything to happen. And trust me, we don't want any relapse of any other thing that's been tragic anywhere else. So that's our main goal. That's why we require permits on everything. Um, and uh, that's pretty much everything I have to say. And we would love to take your questions if you'd like to go up to the mic. Our address is 1660 Mission. It's right um, South Van Ness and Mission Street, uh, right where it crosses. You see right when you come off the freeway, it's right there on Mission Street. It's about halfway up the block on the left-hand side. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. So if you're gonna ask questions, please come to the microphone. Just to start it off, if I call for an inspection and the inspector comes out and the inspection fails, what is the process? Uh, our, for our process is if inspection fails, um, it all depends on what that correction notice is. If it's a plumbing inspection, and I'm going to speak for electrical, yes, as well. If we have a correction notice basically stating this is incorrect and something has to be corrected, then you make the corrections, you call and get a re-inspection of that area that needs to be corrected, and then we move forward. If everything's done correctly, then we would sign off and saying your rough's complete or your final's complete or this area of this work that you did is now correctly done, right? And we would sign that. Pat, anything to add? Just from, from my <coughs> perspective with building inspection, when a correction has to be made, uh, the first thing we think about is, are there plans involved? Is it something that can be corrected by just making some physical correction, or do the plans need to be revised? So if we go out there and we see that you know, the plans show this and additional work was performed, then what that tells the inspector is that a revision permit needs to be obtained to document the additional work. But like Steve says, in most cases with the simple over-the-counter homeowner's permit, kitchen bath remodeling. For us, what we see is we see some missing fire blocking. We, 
see that uh, smoke detectors need to be added <laughs> at the end of the inspection. Those are the usual things. Um, beyond that, we, we, we probably wouldn't be dealing with the average homeowner. We'd be dealing with a contractor. And if the contractor works beyond the scope of the permit and the plans, then you know we have to work with them in order to make sure they get the appropriate revised permit to document the full scope of, of the work. All right, here we go. Uh, thank you again. Uh, so what, what's the general time frame and cost associated with permits? Just like a general, you know, because I know that permits can take a while and stuff like that. General, general question is, yeah. <laughs> all, I, I, I can't give you prices because yeah. that's all over the scope, and, and I, everybody's different. Uh, I won't yeah, the second um, part. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, the general time frame for permit issuance. Uh, once submitted, and this is the answer that I gave it, if it's an over-the-counter permit, you could probably get it done within 48 hours. If it's a submitted project, it all depends on the complication, how complicated the submitted project is. Um, if you're a new building, there's a lot of notification that needs to take place. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't want to throw an answer out there just to give you information because mm -hmm. it may not be accurate information. And I'd rather give you no information than bad information. Okay. 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 Yeah. But if you were to give us an example of what type of permit you're considering, maybe we could give you a, a, a more accurate answer. Uh, maybe just remodeling a small bath in a one unit. How much? How much would? How long would it take to? Okay. Get so that what permit? you're referring to is a simple over-the-counter yeah. application-only permit, mm -hmm. and the the cost associated with that would be. Well, again, we don't we don't deal with costs. If you go to. Section 106 in the San Francisco Building Code. There's a table. There's a there's a uh, there's a cost table okay. that says if your permit valuation is this much or from zero to five thousand dollars, then your permit fee is like two hundred and whatever dollars, and three dollars and forty seven cents for every additional hundred dollars or something like that. So you can kind of get a ballpark of what your permit fees are going to be, mm -hmm. but that's that's divorced from the approval and inspection process. Okay. So would it be reasonable to say, Joe, that if you're coming in to get a permit for a simple bathroom remodel, that maybe you should have four or five hundred bucks in your checking account? That's, yeah. That's what okay. I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah that would be safe to say. Right. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Uh, okay. For a simple bathroom, it would be, uh, for electrical, uh, permit would probably be around $240. Okay. Uh, and the plumbing would be about 150 Okay. Interesting. Cool. Five hundred. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, four or five hundred dollars. We're about in the right ballpark. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so um, I, mine is more kind of a partic particular question, but uh, for remodel. But I have my house is set on the back of the lot line, so I have like a front yard, not a backyard. And so one of my things is I'd like to. I'm thinking of opening up the porch, building a deck out. So. Would I be able to get the information as to what, you know, the parameters are of what I'm allowed to do, point to the DBI website, or, or if not, then who do I see to get that particular information as to, you know, how far I can move the deck out and, and so on? Right. I mean, your, your question is, um, is, a, is for planning, really. So the planning department would have oversight over expansion of... Uh, your, your property in, in so far as you would be building a deck at the front of your existing house. Right. So anything at the front or visible from the street, the planning department will always review that. So if you wanted to get additional information, the first place you should go in what you're describing would be the planning department at the ground floor, 1660 Mission Street. Okay. You come in the door, they're on the right. You take a ticket and you'll, they'll, somebody there will see you and provide you with the information. I see. Okay. So, so that's specific, or for that particular project, that may I may not find what I'm looking for on that website, and I should come oh, into in, in person. It's, you go to the, our website will probably refer you to the planning website. Oh, I see. Oh, and I see. They will have additional information there in regard to uh, uh, building a deck, like you're describing, at the front of your property, I see. because it's street facing. Anything yes. that faces the street is something that the planning department will initially review. 
you will need a building permit uh, to document and memorialize whatever it is the scope of your work ends up being. Okay. But the planning department is a good place to start before you start investing in uh, architects and designers and spending money in, I mean, you want to know what it is you can do. Exactly, yeah. okay, All right. thank you. Uh, and, and just as a note, uh, I did hear, uh, I didn't hear it today, but I heard it earlier that, uh, that this year, uh, that, that the city is taking a 10% discount off on the permit costs for this year, is that correct? The sale is on as far as I understand it. It's already in place. Yeah, right. okay, great. And, and just the last one is, uh, so uh, Ken, you're the uh, acting uh, chief. Uh, is, there, is there a chief inspector still presently? Or? Uh, yes, on, uh, Ron Allen, he's, uh, oh, Ron, oh, Ron but he's Allen. out on a, uh, oh. just not working right now. Okay, I see. Thank you guys very much for this. So kind of a worst case scenario, did a kitchen and bath, did a kitchen and bath remodel. Thank you guys very much for being here. So did a kitchen and bath remodel, got the job card signed off by the inspector. This was about two years ago. Okay. Uh, I just randomly looked it up on the website and it's still open and I've lost the job card. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, that would be, come down to the, come down to 1660 Mission, go to the fourth floor, okay. RMD for records. You can ask them to pull all your records for that address that they have and, and whatever permits we have that are on there. Okay. They would have your plumbing, your electrical, might have some, I don't all know right. about the building, they might have something in, you talk to the building inspector as well at the third floor and see if they have anything in, the, in their computer and as well as, as noted. It could all be noted, everything could be there, it just... Could have just not, not gotten updated yep, on the website? I have, yeah, I, could, I couldn't tell you unless I looked it up and... I can't do that right now. All I right. can uh, <laughs> I can speak to that a little yeah. bit too from uh, the building perspective because if you're looking on, on the website and seeing something that's either issued or expired, you know it's not complete. It needs to show complete. Exactly. And you know it got signed off, but yep. the job card is lost. You can't find it, right? So that's when you come see me or one of the senior building inspectors, and uh, we would just have to research it based on whatever information we can find. Okay. It's, it's hard for us if the building inspector uh, did actually sign it off, but for whatever reason, it didn't get captured in the system. That means we just have to backtrack and find out if we can find a way to, to close your permit. All right, not the end of the world though, solvable. Well, it's not definitely not the end of the world, but yeah. you should reach out and <laughs> okay. you're welcome to reach out to me if you're actually experiencing that. Right. Thank you. I'll give you a card. Thanks. We can work with them though. I have a question related to some kind of safety hassle. I appreciate getting feedback or uh, suggestion from all of you. My wife and I recently bought a brand new house. Uh, it's six months old, so under warranty. And believe it or not, uh, in the sh um, master bathroom, the shower pan, once you get wet, uh, it's so slippery. My wife and I both fell down. Actually, my wife got hurt on, on the leg, uh, got bruised. We contacted the uh, builder and they send a representative over to take a look, and they don't seem to know what to do. And I, I look at the, uh, the shower pan. It's so smooth, the surface is so smooth. There's no in and out surface, you know? So what, what suggestion you have, please? <laughs> Buy a new shower pan? No. Um, uh, <laughs> the, the, the only thing that you could do for something like that is talk to a manufacturer or another representative to actually see if they can, one, take that shine that's on I don't know what the material is that they put on top so I couldn't tell you I, from here and if you have a picture I'll take a look at it later or if you want to eat my card I'll give it to you you can get in contact with me uh, and send me something that you have but if it's like a say a marble finish or something like that or a stone that's really glossy and slippery and all depends what you put on it as yeah. well I don't know what you clean material but they can might be able to take that and deaden that surface and take off nice. that gloss that's on there and actually make it so it's a rougher surface so it doesn't have that slippery finish an acid wash or something like that but i don't know i don't ex i'm not an expert when it comes to that at all don't quote me See, or you can get the, close. you get the sticky little flowers too and put those on there and you know so you know <laughs> so slip. Really i mean nice. i know it looks ugly but it does the trick so, it looks like it might be fiberglass i i've touched it myself it uh, might be fiberglass, no, I, I think what, be fiberglass. You, what you might have there too is oftentimes you see these the tile surround and the shower, and the tile looks so nice, they decide they'll put the wall tile on the floor. Mm -hmm. So if it's really shiny, that means it's probably very slippery. So there may be, there, there's a process of etching to, to take the, the shine off of the tile to make it more so that you won't 
you know, just slip all over the place on this tile because shiny means slippery. Um, they may have used the wall tile on the floor. That has happened in the past. So it sounds like they may not have to remove the whole uh, shower pan. No. There's a, there's Otherwise, so much trouble. No, you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't a, have to remove it if they There's a it. whole science behind this. There's a slip coefficient for, you know, when you oh. walk on slippery tiles. And okay. they, it's used for determining safety in regards to ramps in commercial buildings. Okay. Because we get these complaints. Somebody walks in off the street, commercial building, there's a ramp, raining outside. They slip. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are standards surrounding the slip uh, coefficient in regards to these surfaces. And it's not unheard of that people put these wall tiles, sometimes they put these wall tiles on the floor. Walls are not for walking on. Yeah. So, you know. So it might be etching, as you suggested, that they can yeah. do. Or maybe they can maybe spray something on now, it. Now, it would probably be an etching that you have to do okay. an acid wash and, and take that shine off and make it so it's a dead, so it's, it's not a slippery. No, but, don't, don't yeah. mess with products yourself, though, because yeah. some of those things are. I won't touch are, it. I'll let them do it. Yeah, you've got to get a professional. You'll have another do it. problem. You'll yeah. be in the hospital. Because it's still under warranty, yeah. so I'll let them do it. There you go. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Congratulations. You're welcome. Congratulations. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for the session. Very informational. Um, I, admittedly, I'm a newbie. I um, was curious if you could point me in the right direction as far as requirements if we're looking at a residential property to excavate down um, in order to increase the headroom on like the ground floor of a property. Uh, I can take down one. Um, I think uh, you're a homeowner, right? You're not a, an engineer. Correct. Or, Correct. So what I think about is the requirement is seven foot six for a headroom. There is an allowance for seven-foot headroom in regard to kitchens, closets, storage areas, corridors. So seven-foot six is what you're looking for. So you know if you have six-foot six, you're going to have to go down a foot. So you dig down a foot. Are you compromising the foundation? That's the question. So that's where you would uh, you know, talk to an engineer and... The engineer would most likely say, okay, we got to dig a few test pits around here and see where we're at. So simply put, the foundation might need to be bolstered in regard to whatever excavation you need to do to get that seven foot six. Or your foundation might be deep enough that you don't need to worry about it. You can just dig down because your foundation is already going down two feet. It's all about lateral support for the existing foundation. If you dig down to the bottom of the foundation, then you take away the lateral support that was already there. So that's a structural concern, and you may need to upgrade the foundation if you need to dig a foot in that case. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Hi, thanks so much for doing this. This is very interesting. I'm new here from New York, so I'm learning all the terms. Um, I'm both a potential homeowner and an architect, so I'm looking at houses, and I'm curious as to what um, what happens when you have, I don't know what, the, what you call it here, existing non-conforming structure or... Um, grandfather. Grandfathered in. Um, no the, grandfather. For, I mean, I was looking at this, for instance, wondering if that's grandfathered in, you know, that type of thing. What, yeah. what triggers the, um, the need to bring everything up to code. I mean, exactly. usually electrical, right. I know, or something. So I think about grandfather as your father's father or your mother's father, mm -hmm. nothing more than that. But mm -hmm. I know the planning department have a whole different idea about existing non-conforming. It's, it's more of a planning issue than anything else. But if we are, uh, let's say if the inspector is out there investigating a complaint and it may, it may be that uh, the complaint is addition of dwelling unit without the required permit. Building is only a single family dwelling. There it's being, it's being uh, a second unit is being rented in the building, let's say. So then we go out there, investigate the complaint. Look, it's like, looks like it's been there forever. We do have a process in DBI, and I'm not sure if I'm going to the core of your question here, but we do have a process in DBI where a stakeholder can bring in uh, multiple records, assessor's records, uh, water records, showing us that this unit has indeed been there for a long time. That usually happens in the absence of good permit records. If we don't have them, we have a unit count verification process. That's what we have. 
And if it's something that's not related to being a, a potentially unauthorized unit or a legal unit, because some people actually want to, uh, some people want to add units, some people want to eliminate units and take over the whole house. So it, it, it's, it's different based on what people want. But then again, we have the decks. The deck has been there forever. The neighbor is complaining it's recently been replaced and it was done so without a permit. It was never legal in the first place. They made it bigger, they did this, that. So right now we have a lot more um, sources for you know, looking at this stuff. Um, you know, we can go to Google Street View just like you and mm -hmm. Google Street View has a, a timer clock that we can go back in time and see what was there last year, the year before, all the way back to 2007. So the person that's telling us that the garage was always there and we click back in time and if they're sitting at my desk, I said, where's the garage in 2007? It's not there. So, you know, there are a lot of resources and we put our faith in things like that too because it gives us the information we we need to make an informed decision. And, and if I suspect that something, for instance, uh, uh, the structure is not up to current code, fasteners or whatever, something like that, um, is there a way to, to, to check that? I mean, I would have to have an engineer come in and peek at whatever. If, if you, as an architect, mm -hmm. suspect that there's a structural defect mm -hmm. in a specific building that you're looking at for a client, mm -hmm. I mean, you're... you're uh, course of action would be to contact a structural engineer right. and have them come out and take a look before you submit any permit because mm -hmm. you know you don't want the building inspector coming out when you've already uh, had the permit issued and saying oh look at the wall it's no good you got to rebuild this yeah. that's not what you want exactly it's there, planning there, there is one thing I'd like to add on all of this so everybody understands this no matter what we find, if it is existing, it was always there for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. If we have a health safety violation, no matter what, we're going to make you fix it. We're going to make you change it. I, I just got to stress that a lot because uh, the last time we did meet the pros here and we had the whole summit and everything came up. And it's not what we're looking on purpose and going, if we have something that's, like you're saying, existing and it's in this situation, but it's a health safety, health and life safety we're going to definitely make sure that you correct it and put it back to where nobody can get hurt, nobody can die, nothing can happen that would, you know, affect anyone. And that goes for everything. And I think I'm speaking for everybody here on this panel. We all feel the same way. So health and safety is our main concern. So okay? I, I'd like to echo what Steve is saying because we have had situations in the past where we have buildings that are collapsing and they have to be immediately shored up. So we're not going to say, hey, we need to stop everything until you go to DBI and go get a permit and go through planning and this and that. We will usually say, under the direction of an engineer, immediately short this permit or not, follow up with a permit. Because it's, what Steve is saying is absolutely correct. It's life safety. If there's, if there's a problem, we want it fixed. And we, we can deal with the administrative stuff. But if the problem is not serious, of course, we will say, OK, well, get the permit. You need a permit to fix this. So, <coughs> okay, I want to thank Pat, Joe, Ken, and Steve. Let's give them a hand, please. <laughs>